Drops. I'm Greg. I'm here with Eric. Howdy, howdy. It's been a couple months since we did this. We're a little rusky. Rus- rusky. Yeah, we're a little, yeah, yeah. We, we are rusky, rusky, rusky right now. Rusky. Yeah. Yeah, we've been working on the uh, on the studio, trying to get everything together, and uh, man, we're almost there. Yeah. It's taking a tad bit longer than we thought. Um, so we are uh, now just finalizing it. We said, hey, why don't we just go ahead and do a podcast? It's taking too long. It's been too long. Yeah. Yeah, it's rough. Hold on one second. I think I have to add. Uh, we're going to get this figured out eventually. I have to do cable output three. There, there we, we go. go. There we go. Do that, that one. That should be both of us. Okay. Today we have on uh, Fred Litwin. He is a researcher, author. He has a new book that just came out, uh, On the Trail of Delusion, based on Jim Garrison's investigation. He's mostly known to the average person, like you, Eric. <laughs> You're average. All right. Of um, the Oliver Stone movie, JFK. You know, a lot of people have seen that. They've... Uh, they know it from uh, that movie. Um, what else? So he, he prosecuted a guy named Clay Shaw. And uh, there's a lot of people who believe in it. And it's kind of made a comeback a little bit. Um, but we're going to get into all that stuff with him. All right, Fred, thanks for joining us. Well, it's not great to be here. You want to start out maybe going through your background a little bit? Talking about how you got started in all this? Because um, I understand yeah, you in your first book. And, I'm a Canadian uh, went... who first got interested into this uh, in 1975 when I saw the Zapruder film on the Geraldo Rivera show. Um, I was 18 years old. I was watching it at home. It really hooked me. And I immediately went to the library and started my research. And uh, that led to uh, reading every book I can find. And to make a long story short, I mean, I basically gave up JFK research. I went got an MBA. I ended up working for Intel Corporation in Europe and Asia. I retired uh, in 2000, and I started a music company, Northern Blues Music, and then a film society, and now I'm writing books, and uh, I always wanted to write a JFK book, and three, two years ago, I wrote the book, I Was a Teenage JFK Conspiracy Freak, which went over my conversion from believing in conspiracy to believing that Oswald was the lone gunman, hmm. and once that book was out, uh, there was some criticism that I basically had not, in my chapter on Garrison, I had not really done enough primary research. And so I decided to go out and look at every primary Garrison document I could find. And uh, that led to uh, this new book. So you actually made the jump then. Do, do you, did you find a specific moment that you just made that switch? Was it hard to come to grasp with it, that everything you believed for a long time, uh, you know, now you don't believe or you're starting to question? It was back in the 90s. I was living in England, and I, was, uh, I, I, I got a CD-ROM of the House Select Committee on Assassinations evidence. Huh. And I started going through that, and it just floored me on all the scientific tests that they did and every scientific test backed the lone gunman yeah except and for I the fact decided, that I decided at the end they ruled there was a, a conspiracy right i'm sorry what except at the end though they actually ruled the fact that there was they said there was a conspiracy they did but 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 the uh by then the 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 acoustics evidence had been discredited by the national academy of sciences yeah. And so once you exclude the acoustics evidence, I mean, the House Select Committee ruled, uh, said that Oswald fired the three shots. That led me to uh, be brave enough to buy a copy of Gerald Posner's book, Case Closed. Okay. And I was scared. I, didn't, I really didn't want to read it. I was very scared of opening it. And I opened it to the chapter on the medical evidence one day, and it made so much sense. It just completely changed me overnight to finally understanding... Uh, that there was no conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a scary thing. Like when you, even with politics, right? Everyone has their set view, and it's hard to actually go listen to the other side. Uh, you almost don't want to, but I think it's a very important thing, especially with stuff like this too. Like I, I don't know if you can identify with this. I, I don't think there was a conspiracy, obviously, but I feel like I'm looking for one. I almost want there to be. I want to find one. I just can't find any evidence of it. Every time I found a fact or some sort of claim they bring up, you know, it just doesn't hold water. Yeah, that's the big. That's the the big the big thing is to look and look and look. And what struck me about Jim Garrison was here is a man who did a private or quasi public investigation for two years, um, and he found nothing. I mean, it's really indicative. He followed every lead he could find. 
and he came up with absolutely nothing. So he had to invent a, a conspiracy. Yeah, and that will bring us to... So so he had him. Okay, well, maybe we should start at the beginning. How did Garrison uh, start his investigation? Like, what started out this whole thing? Does it go all the way back to the assassination, or was it because he didn't actually arrest and didn't go on trial until 69, right? Well, it, it goes right back to the assassination because Lee Harvey Oswald lived in New Orleans for five months prior to the assassination. And so right afterwards, there were two interesting leads coming out of New Orleans, and Garrison was involved back in 1963 investigating those leads. One was a lawyer by the name of um, Dean Andrews, who was in hospital at the time um, for double pneumonia. And he claimed that he got a phone call from a Mr. Bertrand to go and represent Lee Harvey Oswald. And so that was a lead that had to be checked out. There was a second lead, and the second lead re related to a man called David Ferry, who was a pilot who uh, organized uh, a group. Uh, he was an instructor under, with a group called the Civil Air Patrol. And one of his uh, so-called enemies, I would guess, somebody didn't like him very much, called the uh, New Orleans police and said uh, David Ferry knew Lee Harvey Oswald. And in fact, uh, I, he had seen David Ferry with a rifle. And so Garrison got, um, had to investigate that as well in 1963. Now, both of those leads went nowhere, but um, the, he, Garrison was involved back then. Mm. The next step for Garrison was back in 1966 when he, I think he was bored, um, and he started reading all <laughs> the assassination books. He read Mark Lane. He read Edward J. Edward J. Epstein. He read uh, Harold Weisberg's Whitewash. And he decided to reinvestigate those New Orleans leads. And uh, once again, they were really going nowhere. And um, he sort of ended up uh, having to make some things up. Hmm. So that was one of the things I was I was asking Greg too. Was you know, I'm, I'm obviously going off of the movie, but everything was kind of right there around where he where he worked and. New Orleans. Was that one of the reasons why he pushed it? Because they made it a lot more romantic than he, he read some books. You know, <laughs> like I always imagined there was something a little bit more that spurred him into this than just hopefully just I think conspiracies. His theory was, I think his theory was that if there was a conspiracy, maybe it was hatched or the plot started in New Orleans. And uh, I think, he, you know, he had very, very lofty political ambitions. And I think he thought that if he solved the JFK assassination, he would not only be a hero, but it would lead to much higher office than just being district attorney. Mm. The chance of a lifetime. Interesting. That's true. So the whole thing was kind of brought about, like you said, by Dean Andrews. He mentioned this guy, uh, Clem Bertrand, and that was printed in the Warren report, right? Uh, his yeah, testimony. He, Dean Andrews about testified that. before the Warren report, Warren commission. It wasn't Clem Bertrand. It was Clay Bertrand. Oh, Clem okay. came later. But it was Clay Bertrand, and Andrews, um, in his testimony, uh, or in his initial FBI in, uh, interviews, uh, described Bertrand as being sort of 5 feet 7, 21 years old, blonde hair, and that morphed into a much older, shorter, uh, uh, different, type, different description of a man later on. So he changed the descriptions. He was heavily sedated um, uh, while, while in hospital. Uh, it was probably a figment of his imagination. I don't know why anybody would want to hire Andrews <laughs> as, as your criminal attorney. <laughs> what kind of attorney was he? Because, I mean, he, he's a very interesting character. Before we got he started here, I was showing Eric a couple uh, interviews of him. He did <laughs> local municipal stuff, you know? It was all municipal court stuff. Okay. He wasn't a criminal attorney. He did sort of hack stuff with, uh, you know, whether it was gay kids in trouble, all sorts of local municipal stuff. And just then, those things he says is just so ridiculous. <laughs> You've been laughing right about his tab, quotes all wrong. morning. Hoo -hoo. <laughs> he is very, very funny guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, John Candy nailed him in the movie. movie. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. And then, so then the other part of this, too, was like you mentioned, that was uh, Jack Martin, right? Jack Martin. Well, Jack Martin kind of was a, an ex felon who, uh, sort of hanger on her, who. Uh, a new David Ferry and new Ray Gill, who was a lawyer who worked for Carlos Marcello. 
And Jack Martin was the kind of guy who was always calling people. Uh, he suffered when he got drunk. He suffered from telephoneitis, hmm. <laughs> and he was always calling people with tips and leads and all sorts of junk. And uh, once he realized that he thought David Ferry was involved, he called everybody to tell them about David Ferry, and uh, that caused Garrison to bring David Ferry in for questioning in December uh, or November 1963. What made it all interesting to Garrison and everybody else was that Ferry was in a New Orleans courtroom uh, when Kennedy was assassinated. And that night, Friday night, he went with two of his uh, buddies, young buddies, uh, on a trip to Houston and Galveston to go ice skating. And they spent the weekend ice skating and then came back and Ferry learned that he was uh, wanted for interrogation. Mm. <clears throat> and that was another thing that Garrison got into. Maybe we can get into this a little bit later. I never understood this, though, that he said that all these people traveled around for an alias, right? So Clay Shaw, we'll get into it a little bit. Clay Shaw went to the West Coast, supposedly for an alias, which doesn't make sense. I mean, he's in New Orleans. He has an to alibi. go to California for an alibi for a crime that yeah. happened in, in Texas. <laughs> yeah, you don't, <laughs> look, you don't need to go to California to have an alibi for the Kennedy assassination. And then same thing with uh, Ferry, right? Supposedly he drove to Houston for an alibi. Or then also other claims were that he was going to be a getaway pilot or something. Uh, the alibi yeah, doesn't he, make sense either because he was in federal court at the time too, right? Yeah, he was, in court. I mean, he was going to be the getaway pilot. And then Garrison at one point realized, well, he didn't go to Dallas. He went to Houston. Um, and so then it was, well, he knew the getaway pilot, you know. And, and um, Garrison sent his investigators to every airport in the Dallas area to go through all the gas receipts to see if he can uh, prove that Ferry had been at one of those airports. Hmm. And he could never find evidence of that. Now, Ferry is an interesting character, like real strange character. Joe Pesci, I don't think they went extreme enough to really <laughs> portray him, right? With like the carpet, pretty much the carpet eyebrows. I mean, the yeah, horrible well, toupee. Uh. Ferry was suffering from alopecia, and so he lost all his body hair. Right. And uh, so he pasted on a wig and he pasted on eyebrows and he had this sort of weirdly weird look. Um, and he was, of course, he was a pilot for Eastern Airlines, but he had lost his job because he uh, had brought an underage boy into the cockpit and, and uh, he was involved with underage boys. He was almost, he was gay. Um, and so he spent a large part of his time um, in 1963, 62, trying to get his job back. Mm. But he was he, he he's really misunderstood. I mean, David Ferry was uh, the kind of guy who, if you were in a restaurant and you had a flat tire, he would go out in the rain to change your flat tire for you. Huh. He, he was a very intelligent man. Uh, um, all the I mean, I'm not going to condone what he did with underage boys or teenage boys, but he always guided them. He taught them how to fly. He always got, and they loved, they really liked him a lot. Not one of them ever turned on him. Hmm. And, but he was involved in some weird stuff too. Not, I mean, maybe not weird, but he was involved in some gun running and uh, different things going on. Well, with, uh, he was Cuba, never involved right? in gun. Well, he, he was, he, he did a lot of work for the anti Cuban, um, anti Cuban, uh, uh, Castro, uh, the anti Cubans in the early, in 1961. Okay. He was very involved, but he stopped all his activities um, because After of the Bay Eastern Bay. Airlines dismissal. Oh, and so that was the end of it. So, and and, and also Carlos Brigier, um met him, and uh, he didn't like gay people, and uh, realized that that Ferry was gay, and he told the other Cubans stay away from this guy. Huh. And Carlos Brigier, he's uh, comes back into this whole JFK thing because he had a fight with Oswald in the street. Right in yeah, New Orleans, he, had, he had a store selling marine supplies, and Oswald came in one day. Oswald was trying to infiltrate anti-Castro groups. Oswald came in, wanted to volunteer to fight. Uh, Carlos Bringer said, well, look, we're not into a military thing. Any, you, know, you know, we're not that interested. And Oswald came back the next day and left his marine guidebook. And a week later, Oswald was handing out pro-Castro literature and Bringier found out about it and led to a fist fight in the streets. So this might be getting a little off topic. Why do you think Oswald first went to him trying to pretend like he was anti-Castro? 
Oswald Several raised some to, red flags with some people, right? Oswald wanted to go to Cuba, and I think he wanted to bring a dossier with him to the Cubans to say, look, I'm, I'm not only am I, I have the fair play for Cuba committee and I'm doing all this stuff for Cuba, but I'm going to, I've tried to infiltrate into your enemies. Um, and I think you, I think you also want that fight to get on to radio, which he did, right. uh, to get in the newspapers. And it helped build his dossier to show the Cubans. To show his fight, yeah, for communism or... That's you know, right. He, for the people. Deeply, he had a picture of Castro on his mantle, on his mantelpiece oh. in his apartment. Wow. Is that, I've heard this too, maybe you can answer this. That's where I heard the name, his alias, that A. Heidel. That was a... H.A. A. Heidel, yeah. Heidel came from Fidel. Heidel came from Fidel. It rhymed with Fidel. Huh. Um, Simple. And that's kind of like the, this whole case, though. The whole Garrison case was kind of just like the six degrees of separation. But, you know, it was person A, new person B. You didn't even know him. Just well, Garrison him did on the something street really one day. brilliant. Garrison did something really smart. He took the ferry string and he took the Bertrand angle and he fused them together into one story through Perry Russo. Yeah. And that was brilliant. I mean, it was it was it was crazy. But he fused them together into one story, um, and th and that's what uh, I mean. In, in a most ridiculous way, he had to use uh, hypnosis and sodium pentothal to do it. But he uh, he had this empty vessel in Perry Russo. And Perry Russo is an interesting one. So, Eric, you watched the JFK movie. Mm. You never heard the name Perry Russo, right? No, they removed him. I uh, think they mentioned his name one time, but they didn't oh, show just him or in, anything. In, yeah, yeah, just real quick throwaway. Instead, they replaced yeah. him with a guy named uh, Willie O'Keefe, right? Yeah, the Kevin Bacon character. Right. Yeah. Why did they do? Why did uh, um, Oliver Stone do that? Well, Willie O'Keefe in the movie was a composite of four different characters: Perry Russo, David Logan, and and um, William Martin, and, and another person, uh, Will, uh, uh, Raymond Brochiers. And I think Gary, uh, Stone wanted to use some stuff from some of those other three people, both, all of which are all frauds. Uh, but it allowed him to meld several stories together into one character. And I think uh, making it a gay prostitute um, made it a very delicious role for Kevin Bacon. Hmm. He did a good job on it. It was good. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and he did that with a few times, too. Like uh, Janet Williams, I think they called her. Um, for the pains that Oswald stayed at here in uh, yeah. in Irving. Yeah. Um, there was just several characters that kind of made up. It, some of that, I guess, yeah, it makes sense for the sake of time, right? Because they, they were stuffing so many facts into that movie. Um, it just kind of starts making you dizzy trying to keep track of all of it. But why did they change yeah. the pains name? Was that like a legal issue? Could have been legal. He may not have been wanted to be sued by the pains. Yeah. Um... Okay, so then this whole thing, it was Garrison arrested a guy by the name of Clay Shaw. He was a businessman in New Orleans. He had just retired, right? Yeah, um, well, he retired a few years earlier. But uh, Garrison, uh, one of Garrison's associates, they were thinking about, who is this guy, Clay Bertrand? And, right. and Garrison had this idea that gay people, when they use a pseudonym, don't change their first name. <laughs> and so he was looking for somebody who was gay who had the name Clay, and who spoke Spanish. And they realized, oh, Clay Shaw is gay. Same first name. He speaks Spanish. He must be Clay Bertrand. Wow. Jeez. And so they they called him in for questioning, and and uh, Shaw had no idea why they, why they were calling him in. He thought maybe they were calling him in because Oswald had leafleted the Trade Center back in 63. Right, because he, um, he was there at the time when he was doing that, right? He was actually up in the building. He was he was he he actually didn't see Oswald, but obviously no. he was in the building. But um, uh, and that was the end of it. He just thought, oh, this is kind of it was nothing. And then, of course, it became more serious when he uh, was called in for questioning uh, in March, which is when they ended up arresting him. When, then. when they arrested him that day, and that was March first, what the sixty-seven, right? That's it right. Went, yeah, it went two years before he actually finally went to trial. That's right. That would be that'd be difficult. Can you imagine going on with your life for two years, knowing that you're about to be prosecuted for the murder of the president mm. when you were innocent or if, you, or if you're guilty? That's the two things, right? Either he was innocent or he was guilty. There's really no in between. Either he was or he wasn't. 
If he was, I mean, this guy seems like the worst possible conspirator of all time. I mean, he supposedly went around. He went to the airport out there. He wrote down the name Clay Birch. He was still using the alias that was printed publicly in the Warren report, right? Years afterward. Like, I, I just feel like if you're going to pull off a conspiracy to murder the president, you would burn all the aliases, right? You'd get rid of them. Never right. use them again. You don't want anyone finding that out. Right. Instead, yeah, though, Clay Shaw was supposedly still using it at the airport. He was using yeah. it. Uh, he had his mail being forwarded, right? Under that same That's name. Right. Just all sorts of ridiculous stuff. He was the worst. He, said, you know, I, I, he said, look, I'm six feet four. I stand out in New Orleans. I've been on TV hundreds of times. Everybody knew me. How could I use an alias like that? Yeah. And then the other part that doesn't make sense to me is the fact that uh, supposedly he met random people on the street and had open discussions about murdering the president and all the details of it in front of complete strangers. Like Perry Russo or Charles Spiel. Uh, I already forgot how you say that. Right. Just completely openly discussed all this stuff. Here's what we're going to do. Triangulation <laughs> and crossfire. <laughs> Just don't say anything, please. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Here is Perry Russo saying he attends a party where they're talking about killing Kennedy. Kennedy gets killed. He never goes back to David Ferry and say, "Hey, your plan worked. What you know? Wow, you were you were that was it was you did it." He never asked him anything. He never said a word. He never went to the Warren Commission. He never went to the FBI. And he was asked, "Why didn't you go to the FBI afterwards?" He said, "Well, I was busy with my studies. School was so <laughs> important." Mm. So let's talk about Perry Russo because he's an interesting one. So he yeah. he actually knew Ferry, right? That part is true. Well, he knew most the, he, he most likely knew Ferry. Although all the all the people who were David Ferry's roommates do not remember Perry Russo. Huh. So suppose so, so Ferry's story was that he or not? I'm sorry, not Ferry. Uh, Russo's story was that he hung out at Ferry's house, and also we should say in case people don't know. Uh, Ferry ended up dying before Russo came forward, right? Yes, that R Russo came forward after Ferry died. All right, so Ferry couldn't defend himself or say anything, unfortunately. Well, he he and and you know he died, and then all of a sudden Garrison made it into a big mystery. Uh, Garrison made it into a suicide when, in fact, Ferry died of natural causes. He died of a very aneurysm. Uh, but Garrison couldn't accept that. It had to be either suicide or murder. Yeah, it is suspicious. So, I mean, you, you can understand how, I mean, obviously you too, you at one point believe there was a conspiracy. I did too. Um, it's just, you know, fodder. It, I mean, it's just kindling for uh, believing a yeah, conspiracy but... while he's investigating Ferry and then all of a sudden he does. Yeah, well, if you read, and if you read the documents, I mean, Ferry had been suffering, uh, he had been ill for quite some time and he, he was... Uh, suffering from headaches and uh he could he had trouble walking up the stairs when he met with david snyder after the probe became public i mean snyder went to his apartment and ferry uh uh could barely walk up the stairs and he told a lot of his friends that he was dying hmm. um he was so sick um oh a random side note i was looking on zillow after reading the different testimonies and you know they always leave the address you lived on elysian uh, way or something and his apartment's for rent right now. You can rent it if you want. <laughs> in New Orleans, oh, yeah. David Ferry's apartment. Yeah. You can now have a piece of history. Fields, that's, that's Perry Russo. Perry Russo's apartment? Yeah. Uh, Ferry, uh, David Ferry lived on Louisiana Parkway. Oh, Louisiana Parkway. No, I know it's Ferry. I just said the wrong one. Ferry's apartment okay. is the one with the kind of the curved thing, the windows and all that. Um, yeah, it's like 700 bucks. You want to pitch in? We can own a piece of history where the conspiracy happened. Yeah, right you where can Russo like and everyone planned. Mount your mount your gun up on the above the doorway when yeah, you walk in and out. The car, the yeah, maybe yeah. you could take out the floorboards and find something. Maybe, yeah. Garrison will come back from the dead, <laughs> and he'll charge <laughs> somebody again. Oh, I shouldn't say that, but um. So basically, uh, Perry Russo, he was he was pretty young at the time, right? He was in college. Yeah, he was in his early 20s. He was like, you know, he was very young. He was hanging he, out, he was, most likely hanging out with Ferry uh, randomly. I think he said he went over there a few times that summer. Maybe 10 times, I think. He said he went over there a few times. He was, and then maybe there, he was very, up, up, Russo was very involved in pornographic films and pornographic pictures. And, and um, he was doing a lot of strange things back then. Oh, that's right. Didn't he? 
didn't he say that uh, Ferry brought a film to him, supposedly from Cuba, and had it, him sell well, it? Well, I don't think from Cuba, but I mean, they they were doing a lot of things with pictures. He was he was luring. Uh, he had a girlfriend who was luring boys to take pic so they could take pictures of them, and there was a lot of. Uh, you could read this in some of the investigative files of uh, Clay Shaw's attorney. Okay, interesting. I didn't, yeah, I didn't know all that. Just I, I pretty much just read the testimonies, so whatever they said in there. Um, and then basically, what he said there was a there was a man there, tall guy with white hair, and uh, he introduced himself. I think he said he heard the name Clem. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Russo said nothing about Clay Shaw when he was first interviewed by uh, Andrew Chambra. Right. It was only under, after he they administered sodium pentothal that this story started to come out, and then he was hypnotized three times. Um, and by the end of it, he was telling the story about a party where they all discussed JFK's assassination. Yeah, it, it gets so confusing too, and it's hard to even tell what is what because uh, Chambra he wrote it was two or even three memorandums on it, right? So the first one when he first went up there and met uh, Perry Russo. He didn't actually, he took the notes, but he didn't actually write it up till after he already did the interview under sodium pentothal, right? No, I think he, I'm not sure when he wrote it. Well, he wrote it up pretty or quickly, he but he had a 3,500 word memorandum and he never mentioned, there's not one word in there, about Clay Shaw or Ann Hardy. Um, and, and Russo said that he shot, met Shaw twice only once uh, when JFK came to Nashville to speak and once at a service station. Yeah. And, uh, and then the story yeah, just kept changing. So, but, but even the finalized story, the final story that Garrison and his investigator, Chambra, that's who we're talking about when we mentioned him. He was an investigator for uh, Garrison. The final story that came out in the trial, it doesn't really implicate uh, Shaw necessarily at all. It doesn't seem like it. Because the whole thing that Perry Russo was telling is that Ferry was doing all the talking, right? And all yeah, Ferry said he was... Also also, Russo admitted under oath that, that he didn't think there was a conspiracy and that it was basically just a bull session. Right. Yeah, all he said was, um, let's see if I can remember the exact thing. He said, we're going to get him, you know, don't worry, we'll get him one day. We'll get the president. And then he was talking about a, a general idea of an assassination inside of an auditorium. Yeah. Talking about triangulation or crossfire, I guess. Yeah, um, crossfire. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if someone would fire a shot, a diversionary shot, get everyone looking the opposite direction, which that didn't even happen in Dallas, right? Everyone thought the first shot was just, you know, fireworks or firecrackers or a car backfiring or something. That's right. And uh, the whole story, I think the only thing Clay Shaw was saying in Perry Russo's story was, you're not going to be able to get away with it or something like that, right? He didn't actually say, yeah, let's do it or nothing like that. Yeah, there was nothing like that at all. I mean, it was it was just a very loose, so-called loose conversation. It was really, and that's what I have to laugh because Charles Spiesel had the exact same story to another party where they said the exact, the exact same, right? same loose conversation. I mean, what kind of conspirators are those? Just talk about it at, a par at parties with total strangers again, yeah. But yeah, that, that, I mean, that's what blows my mind, though. I, I don't see how you could even even if it was true. He, I don't think Shaw implicated himself in any way by saying that i mean all he said is oh it's not possible you're not gonna be able to do it and supposedly then oswald said ferry's a pilot you know he'll be able to do it don't worry and yeah, that was pretty much it and also don't forget perry russo described oswald as having a beard and being completely unclean and dirty when in fact in real life he was he never had a beard and he was always very very specific and uh, about his hygiene his personal right. hygiene and uh yeah, I think Maria, Marina Oswald, you know, testified. I think a few other people testified. And then there was a bunch of debate going back and forth. Uh, what is it a beard or is it a little bit of stubble or what? Uh, three or five, three or four days of growth. And they were debating back and forth what that meant. It's kind of funny reading through the whole transcript. So the whole case pretty much revolved around him um, because the only other witness in the entire case that said anything about any sort of conspiracy or any evidence toward it was that uh, Charles Spe uh, Spiesel. Spiesel. I can't say that name. That's right. Charles Spiesel was the only one who really talked about any sort of conspiracy, and uh, he was proved to be quite the nutcase. Oh yeah. You want to tell? You want to tell everyone what happened with him? Yeah, he claimed he that, that he was 
hypnotized by the police and all sorts of people for a period of 16 years. He had a massive lawsuit against a variety of people for uh, for damages. He actually fingerprinted his daughter every time she went to university <laughs> and came back to make sure she was the same person. I wonder what she thought about that. Did she ever say anything? You know, she's like, come on, dad. Like, do you really have to fingerprint me? And if she, you know, and if it was me and if I was her, I'd come back and I'd like have like some kind of fake fingerprint on there to really throw him off, you know, just one. And uh, so he was, he was crazy. And, and uh, that all came out on the, uh, in cross-examination. And, and he, what I thought was interesting, Spiesel said that he told all this to Garrison staff. That's what I was going to ask you next. Do you think Garrison knew about that? Before I think there's uh, Tom Bethel, who was one of the staff, me- one of Garrison staff members, wrote. He was keeping a diary at the time, and if you check his diary, at the time he was writing, Spiesel was crazy. Hmm. And so uh, they probably knew, and they probably thought because there was no uh, discovery that uh, uh, Shaw's attorneys would never find this stuff out. So let's put him on the stand. Wow. And that's like that's pretty much his whole case too. Who was um, David Ferry's friend? He drove to Houston with. Wasn't there the issue of uh, how one of Garrison's investigators tried to bribe him to get him to tell well, the yes, same story I, I, as Russo? It was Alba Alba Buff and yep. Mel Coffey were the two guys. Alba Buff and I spoke to Alba Buff. He's still alive. Oh yeah. He's seventy four years old. He lives in uh, in uh, in Louisiana. I called him. He was on the trip with David Ferry. And, you know, a lot of the conspiracy people say, oh, uh, or Garrison said, oh, he would never drive. He drove through a thunderstorm. <laughs> he would never do that. And Bo Buff told me, he said, this is crazy. He said, if you knew David Ferry, he would fly through a thunderstorm. He couldn't care less. He was fearless. So driving through a rainstorm, that's nothing. And uh, Al Bo Buff was a fairly prolific uh, roller skater. He had won all sorts of championships, and he had never gone ice skating. And so he convinced David Ferry to go to Houston. They would go ice skating. There was no ice skating rink in New Orleans. And that's what they did. And also part of it, too, was uh, Ferry had just ended a, a big project he was working on, the case. Again, it's yeah, he was kind on a big of, case uh, in New Orleans. Now, right. what makes it all interesting is that Garrison's men uh, bribed, wanted to bribe Buff into talking about you know a larger conspiracy and they were taped there was a tape recording um of the bribe offer yeah and, they, they were not they were they were they were trying to be not direct about it but they were they were offering him a job at an airline right they were, they were offering him money, grand. A job at an airline and um it was it was taped and that came out and garrison's men uh came to Bo Buff and they they they, they put a gun in his mouth and they said, you, you, know, you better uh, recant this. And uh, like the next day or a few days later, he went back down to Garrison's office and signed a, uh, a memo saying that, you know, he, there was no bribe. Huh. Wow. But I spoke to him. Now I spoke to him. He said there definitely was a bribe. And the reason he signed that paper was that Garrison's men were following him around in New Orleans and he couldn't get a job. Every time he applied for a job, Garrison's men would, would go and visit that potential employer, and he couldn't find work. And signing that paper was the only way to get Garrison's men out of his hair. That's terrifying. Can you mm. imagine your own district attorney? I yep. mean, doing this type of stuff. Why was he never brought up on any abuse of power or, or anything? People were scared of Garrison. I mean, he he, uh, he when he when he got into power, he went after the judges, he went after the police, he went after the mayor. He went after he his went predecessor after, too, right? He charged his predecessor. Yeah, he went after everybody, and people were scared. I mean, he had a lot of power, um, and so they were definitely not going to. Had no idea what to do, and 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 what was really scary for Clay Shaw's friends and family, and uh, was that they themselves were believing that they might be charged with conspiracy too. Yeah. They didn't know. I mean, they were worried one day they'll be hauled in. And so people were scared of Garrison. Hmm. Yeah. That's gotta be scary. you know, for Shaw to then continue living there afterward or even Perry Russo too. Right. Because, uh, after, so after this trial ended, Shaw was found not guilty very quickly. Um, 
then Garrison continued on and, and charged, tried to charge him with per, uh, perjury, right? Yeah, the, the, the first business day after the acquittal, Garrison charged him with two counts of perjury, uh, which carried a penalty of 20 years in prison, same as the conspiracy charge. Hmm. And, and the evidence he used was the exact same evidence that the jury rejected during the actual well, conspiracy trial, right? Well, not only that, I mean, he actually, if you read the memos, he actually instructed the staff, let's go find out new evidence to convince um, everybody that, that Shaw knew Oswald and knew Ferry. And so they they wrote as many memos where they were trying to find new evidence. And of course, there was none. They could only find rumors. I'll tell you one of the funniest ones was back in 1962, there was a, a gay party in the parish next door and 93 people were arrested. It was at a fag ball. <laughs> 93 people were arrested in 1962 and Garrison went back to the list of people who were arrested and he wanted to find out if any there, well, David Ferry or Shaw was on the list of those arrested. Uh, they weren't. And he wanted to check out any of their friends who were on the list. And that was a big research project. And it was in one of his memos, the head of the vice squad called it a party for perverts. Hmm. Jeez. Yeah, it's got to be tough back in those days to be, to have been gay. It was, Especially you know, with watching the JFK this. movie, I didn't know there was like so much homosexual like parts to this yeah. at all. I had no idea. Well, I think Garrison thought maybe that would help his case too. Look at these people. They're degenerates. Right? Yeah. So... Of course, they After would be involved while, in a conspiracy. For a while, Garrison actually believed that there was a homosexual conspiracy, uh. and that, and and he really believed that um, Clay Shaw. You know, this, this is convoluted. Clay Shaw could never get somebody as uh, good looking as Kennedy into bed, and so the only solution was to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And uh, is, is it true too that? Uh... Garrison originally stated that he thought it was a, the whole thing, the whole murder of Kennedy was a big homosexual thrill kill. Yeah, that was part of it. First, it was a, a homosexual thrill kill. And then when they searched Shaw's home and they found uh, a few whips, it ter- then morphed into an S&M um, uh, kill. And Garrison became enraptured with the world of S&M. Uh, <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> and I, I have some of the memos in my in my book. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. There's a memo there from one of his investigators, William Turner, saying, uh, "Oh, I know a couple in San Francisco who are into S and M, and if we need any experts on the world of S and M, we could ask them any questions." And a lot of that stuff that uh, um, Clay Shaw had too was uh, for Mardi Gras, right? Well, like it was different outfits and costumes. Gras, the, it was for Mardi Gras, but the, the secret was that Shaw was into S and M. Oh, he was okay. He was. See, I don't have as much knowledge on the background and all the research in the background. I, I've really just read through the actual trial. So, if it didn't come yeah. up then, but it actually is proven that he was involved. He in was. Okay, he was. But here's what's interesting: um, James Kirkwood, who wrote the book American Grotesque, which is a terrific book on the trial. He did an interview with Irvin Diamond, who was Clay Shaw's trial attorney. attorney yeah. And he asked Diamond, he said, why didn't Garrison bring up the issue of homosexuality at the trial? Yeah. And Diamond said, we had a secret weapon. And Kirkwood said, what was your secret weapon? He says, turn off the tape recorder. And Kirkwood turned off the tape recorder. And when he turned the recorder back on, Diamond said, and we were going to use it. So they had some piece of information that allowed them to tell Garrison, don't bring up homosexuality at the trial. Something on Garrison or maybe somebody close to him, you think? Something on Garrison, um, uh, or it could have been something on Mark Lane, because there was a picture circulating of Mark Lane at the time that was quite lewd. I don't know. And real quick, Mark, Mark Lane was like the first conspiracy theorist, right? Mark I mean, Lane he was, actually uh, testified at the Warren report, right? Yeah, Mark Lane was sort of a purse chaser who uh, inserted himself into the JFK assassination and wrote the big book, Rush to Judgment, in 1966. He was a horrible man. Hmm. And he just recently died, too. Or, or am I getting that confused? Yeah, Not he died five or six years ago. He died, and uh, he lived till I think, 89. 
Did you ever get to talk to him? No, I never talked to him. Hmm. What about uh, Garrison died? I think that was back in the 90s, right? Late 90s. He died right after the movie came out. So he was in the movie, JFK, but he died right after the movie came out. Okay. And and then Clay Shaw died in the 70s, unfortunately. 74. Perry died. What about yeah, Perry I mean, Russo? Is he still around? No, no. Perry Russo died quite young, so many years ago. He was in his mm-hmm. 50s. And then you were talking about uh, Oswald's wife still around. She's living over here. Yeah, she's living really far away from us. Yeah, uh, yeah. Marina, she's still alive, and and uh, she, you know, I've I've actually talked to people who know her quite well, and she she really has doesn't have that much to say about it. Right. She really doesn't know that much. She was in a weird spot too, right? Because she didn't speak any English when she knew Oswald, like barely anything at all. And then she slowly began to learn English. You know, during the actual Warren Commission, she could barely speak any of it. She had a translator, and then it slowly got better. So that's going to be difficult, trying to trying to not only learn a new language, but then trying to go back and process all this stuff. Because you were hearing the words, you were hearing English words, and you know the words now, but you can't quite remember exactly yeah. what they were back then, because you didn't know what they were saying back then. Yeah, and also she had a newborn baby, right? So she had two kids yeah. and a newborn, and so it was... Uh... She had a lot of work for her to do and to, to grasp that her husband had killed the president of the United States. I mean, it's it's a big psychological thing. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one. And then uh, what about what about his kids, the two daughters? I mean, they're, they're grown now, right? Do they – I think I saw an interview with June. Yeah, Rachel she and June, they're, they're, they're around and uh, – yeah, I think there are some interviews out there. You know, uh, I know one. I know back in the the '60s, uh, National Enquirer did something on the on the children, and um, Marina Oswald called up Hugh Ainsworth, and he said, "You know what? Go hire a lawyer and sue National Enquirer." And uh, she did, and she she won a nice little settlement from them. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I mean it's gonna be tough, right? You know, you were. A couple months old when you're or a couple years old in the other case of june right uh when your father died you don't know anything about it it's not like you're gonna have some secret key that'll unwrap the whole conspiracy or something um and their whole life is living in the shadow of that so i can understand they want to try to remain you know out of the public spotlight and not to yeah. deal with that they're all they already have been dealing with it their whole life do you know what their opinion of it is because i did see a one small clip and uh she was saying that she does start to think her father is innocent now, I guess. But who wouldn't, right? It's your own family. No one wants to believe that about their father or their kids you know, or anything. Marina, I think Marina has switched. She, for years, she believed that Oswald was guilty, and now she believes there was a conspiracy. I think the years of conspiracy books and people bugging her have, have gotten her to change her mind. Huh. It, yeah, it's funny how many people have switched. Uh, and then how many different theories there are, too. So... A lot of people think Oswald was innocent and all that stuff, and he was involved in all these different things. And then even his uh, mother, right, Marguerite, who she was she, in a position she, to know a lot of those conspiracy things, things are BS. But then she, she still believed there was a conspiracy, work. right? She was a piece of work, his mother. I mean, on the on the afternoon of the assassination, she called up the uh, the Dallas Herald, um, and she wanted a reporter to take her to the police station, and Bob Schieffer of CBS News picked her up to take her to the police station. And all she could complain about was the fact that Marina was going to get all the money uh, for people feeling sorry for her. And as the mother, she would not get any money. And she did, though. She she did, uh, from what I've read, she did pretty well. And then she kind of went downhill. She started, you know, a lot of people did send her money. They felt bad for her. And then she kind of fell into alcoholism. She sold sold everything she could that, you know, Oswald's... uh, any letter she sold every every piece of material she could uh, from from Oswald for money, the wedding ring, everything, right? His, uh, I think John Latimer bought brought bought his uh, Marine uh, test score book for riflery. Mm-hmm. Mm. Even the rifle too, right? Didn't she try to sell it and had a whole lawsuit against the government trying to get the rifle? That be, I don't know the details of that, but that could be it. Would be it's that's her character. Hmm. Well, yeah. the story the human story about Geraldo Rivera. Yeah. Geraldo Rivera was going to have her on the show, and uh, he, I think he agreed to pay her $500. And then she said, well, you know, I have in my house a little shrine to Lee Harvey Oswald. Do you want to see that? And Rivera said yes. 
Well, that's an extra five hundred dollars. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the Geraldo Rivera is interesting because that was where the world first finally saw the famous uh, Zapruder film, right? That's right. Back in what was that? Nineteen mid seventies. March seventy five. March seventy five. And you were even mentioning earlier that's what kind of got your your your, your kick off and the uh, the whole JFK thing. Do you ever wonder why you're so interested in it? I do. Well, I, think <laughs> I can't it, figure yeah. out why I can't get out of it. Either. But I mean, it was such a shocking thing to see and, and the, the head going back into the left. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think I really had to find out, well, why, why did his head go back into the left? I, it became an obsession to find out what really happened. Yeah. Sorry, I'm laughing. That the movie just it's just him saying it over back and to the left. Yeah, yeah. that's just <laughs> a famous line now. A lot of people haven't even seen the movie, but they know that line. You know? Oh, they my just God. don't know what it's from. <sighs> um, do you ever feel like, like I said earlier, I I, I kind of feel like I'm looking for a conspiracy. Like I I like to look into every last detail I could find. Anything, anything that a conspiracy theorist will bring up to find out if there's any truth there. I just you know haven't found any that that's yeah. incredible. Well, I buy, look, I buy all most conspiracy books I buy um, and I'll read, you know, most, not all, because some are really crazy, but I'll buy the mainstream conspiracy books just in case there might be something you don't something know or haven't heard. Uh, but there never is, but I'll keep on buying them. I mean, Josiah Thompson is going to come up with a new book in November Oh yeah, called uh, Last Second in Dallas. So I will get that book and uh, uh, I, I, he's going to focus on Headshot. So I asked uh, Dr. John McAdams this, and I'd be interested to hear your answer too. If uh, you know, if it came out there was some new evidence, some new CIA document was released or whatever, and it proved that there was a conspiracy, which one of all the conspiracy theories you've heard would you be least surprised by? Or basically, which uh, conspiracy theory do you think holds most water? More is the most likely. To be true, if there was I, I've always true. wondered is was is it possible that there was an, a Cuban in Dallas who egged on Oswald, huh. who told him, "Okay, Kennedy's coming. You got to take this opportunity. You got to do it," you, and, and really primed him to kill Kennedy. Somebody from a Cuban agent. Do you put any stock into Sylvia Odio's story? Well, I do, and but it's in an interesting way. And you, the book that you should read is Oswald's Game by Jean Davison, one of the best books on the case. And her analysis of, of Odio is uh, very different. She feels it was yet another attempt by Oswald to infiltrate the anti-Castro movement, to gain some intelligence, to use uh, to show the Cubans what he knew about um, the people against them. Yeah, because I, I think that story is, is is one of the most believable of the conspiracy ones, at least. And that's not saying a lot. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, well, it, it is, but... Because uh, the time frame we... fits perfectly. It could fit. It, it Like, it fits in that gap almost perfectly of where we have a gap in knowledge of where Oswald was from when he was in New Orleans and uh, Marina and the kids left, or her yeah. kid, child. And uh, then he, you know, appears in Houston and goes to Mexico City. Well, I think the failure of the conspiracy authors is they take the audio story and the only possible explanation they come up with is conspiracy. And if you read G. Davison's book, she takes the exact same incident and she says, well, hold it. Here's a very different interpretation, one that does not involve conspiracy and one that is quite consistent with the behavior of Oswald. Yeah, like in New Orleans, yeah. Like he did in New Orleans. Do you put any stock into Guy uh, uh, Brunier? Br- I can never say his name properly. Carlos Brunier? I'm always bad with names. <laughs> but yes, uh, so when he testified to the Warren Commission, he was saying that he had heard information from his friends that uh, Castro had a spy in their training camp, not his training camp, like a, in a training camp right aclo- across the lake. And that guy got caught. And uh, they were saying to expect in the next couple of days another Castro agent to try to come in and uh, infiltrate your organization. And then two days later, that's when Oswald showed up with his Marine book uh, trying to join the organization. Well, I think there was a Castro agent, I think, in that camp. That camp was, was a pretty ragtag camp across uh, Link Pontchartrain. Um, I don't know. You know, I, 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 
you, you know, Bringier, I've read his book and he really sees Castro behind the assassination. Um, there's just, I, I, I have a hard time believing that Castro would do something like that because if you get caught, the consequences are pretty ominous. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. But at the same time, you can then argue that, you know, Castro is well aware of all the assassination attempts the CIA had tried to pull on him. Yep. And he was. And I think that's what incensed Oswald when he saw the article in the, uh, in the Times Picayune, where Castro had warned American leaders would not be safe if these attacks continued. I think that incensed Oswald when he saw that. Hmm. You have any questions to bring up? Oh yeah, yeah, I got, I got a bunch. Uh, yeah, so just, just to just to step back to just a little bit of the basics and just conspiracy theory. Uh, you know, we were talking about your book on how you basically converted over to not being a JFK consp- conspiracy theorist. Now, if I if I were to be on the street like Greg was talking about, walking through Dealey Plaza and, and talking to the guys that are trying to sell books, and if I'm I'm talking to a not necessarily a, a conspiracy theorist who's trying to like sell a book and has an agenda, but just an open person who thinks that the 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 JFK assassination was like this you know big triangulated shot in Dealey Plaza, like how do you? deal with people like that and how do you try to say hey look this is what it is you know do you have like a a strategy to talk to people about conspiracy theories well there's certain people that are so far gone that you can't really talk to them and you really shouldn't waste your time but there's a whole variety of people in the middle who are interested in the assassination aren't really sure who are amenable to a reasonable uh, discussion and are amenable to looking at the evidence and those are the people that you can you can reach. And I see it every day on Facebook, where we actually have lots of discussions and debates about parts of the assassination. And you could win points um, and convince a lot of people in the middle. The the crazy ones you'll never convince because they're too far gone. Um, so I, you know, and, and that's why I think the tide is turning on the JFK assassination. More people since 2000, uh, the number of people not believing in conspiracy has risen quite dramatically. Yeah, it's at its lowest point, right? That it's that it's ever been, I think. Oh, well, maybe since the Warren report came out, but it's at its lowest yeah. point that uh, yeah. people actually believe there was a conspiracy, and it's still continuing to go that way. It seems. Yeah, and I think for the first time, I mean, you, can, I mean, when I when I started looking into the case in 1975, there were only conspiracy books. Now, for anybody new into the case, you go to the library and you'll find some very good non-conspiracy books. And if you're honest, you'll have to read those as well. Yeah. It, it's really difficult, though, to argue with some of these people. I've done it in YouTube comments, you know. Um, yeah, it's impossible, some and, of them. Right. They'll bring up a point, and then you'll explain that point, and then they just quickly shift over to another point, right? You can never hammer them down yeah. on any one thing. They just jump what's, over what's to the next is, one. What's really frustrating is sometimes on face in a Facebook group, you'll spend a week discussing the single bullet theory and you'll you think you've made some progress and then two days later somebody will come up with start with the exact same quote about how crazy the single bullet theory is like go back and read this whole thing go there <laughs> yeah, go to, i'm not go, gonna do I'm this gonna again and, so i really want to re-argue this again i mean it's, it just gets tiring you know to, to keep on doing it right and, and then they'll also start coming up with some real obscure stories too right like who was the uh the lady, uh, again, I'm horrible with names. The Babushka lady? Well, her too, yeah, all that stuff. Her, Umbrella Man, but also who was the one that in the JFK movie they said was a dope runner for Ruby? The one who got thrown out of a car and she was in a hospital. Oh, yeah, Rose she Jeremy. Claiming... Rose, Rose Jeremy. And uh, yeah. supposedly she claimed before the assassination that they were about to kill Kennedy, but then other people are saying that, no, she didn't say that until afterward. Uh, she was withdrawing from drugs and all that stuff. Um, yeah, another. You know, yeah, I can just imagine the conspirators going, "Well, yeah, we'll, we're going to tell this uh, drug-induced prostitute our whole plans for killing Kennedy." This was the worst conspiracy. It was the best and worst conspiracy uh, of all time. <laughs> if, know, if it yeah. really was, they they're pulled off farming. the perfect thing. They yeah. can't keep their mouth shut. They pulled off the perfect conspiracy where we, they got us all sitting here talking about, like, no, it was, there was no conspiracy. But at the same time, they were saying all this stuff openly and making all these ridiculous mistakes. Right. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. And, of course, if you, you, you want to blame Lee Harvey Oswald for it by having eight assassins. Yeah. That's the <laughs> other thing. 
that's the other thing too. Like, uh, I was talking to the guy in Dealey Plaza, and he told me there were fifteen shots, <laughs> fifteen right. shots in Dealey Plaza that day. Yeah, fifteen. And I, I asked him, I'm like, does it bother you that nobody, none of the witness of like the hundred witnesses that were there, no one, I don't think anyone said that that they heard more than six. Uh, he's no. like, they're all lying. They're all paid by the CIA. The CIA. Which really <laughs> said even Mary me. Mormon, and, and yeah. <laughs> he got mad. Of at course. That, but. The CIA pays me directly. I have direct deposit. Oh, nice. Yeah, there you go. I'm working on getting mine set up. Keeping them off the trail. Well, yeah. use, if you want direct deposit, you got to use your decoder ring and go to the settings channel. Oh, I got to get my, my fifth box of Cheerios, and I finally get the last one so I can get the decoder ring. <laughs> you know. I got to save all the, top, the, the, the tops of them, you know? Mail them in. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was with, with the CIA is it seems like this, the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s CIA was pretty gangster. I mean, they were doing some ridiculous shit out there. You know, right. like Project really Azorian. Were. You know, they're spying on almost everybody, right? They're assassinating people. They're, uh, oh, I just, I, I, they're, everybody in South America is getting shot at, right, by the CIA. Yeah, they overthrew, <laughs> you know, several, several countries in the South America, Central America. Yeah, coups and everything. Even it, Cuba. Yeah, everything seems to kind of, everybody always seems to tie it all back to the CIA because it's real easy because it's all the secrets, right? There's nothing there that you can, yeah. and the CIA is not going to fight back, right? We saw it with UFOs, well, even right? Well, they do, who's going to Well, they them? won't fight back, but all, do you, do you remember the um, the Pike report? No. It was, it, was a house, it? it was a House committee report on CIA activities, and they had a slightly different view. They actually, uh, went through all the failures of the CIA. Take the, uh, the Soviet inv invasion of, of Czechoslovakia in yeah. 1968. Completely missed by the CIA. They had no idea what was going on. Right. Huh. And there's a whole, a whole range of other failures by the CIA where they just completely miss things. Um, this wasn't some super agency. This was a, you know, an agency full of human beings trying to do the bidding of the president at the time. Um, and but the, the conspiracy people make it into like this super agency that can do anything. You're right, right. Anything and everything, yeah. Except, I mean, you saw them trying to assa uh, assassinate Castro. I mean, how many times did they try that and they just failed miserably? They, they and failed were and again, that was at the behest of the Kennedys. Right. It wasn't like they were doing it by themselves. Yeah, right. I think a lot of uh, going back to Gar a lot of Garrison apology. You talk about Oliver Stone. They try to portray Kennedy as somebody who was trying to stop it, right? His famous line where he said he's going to smash the CIA into a million pieces for their failure at uh, in the Bay of Pigs. Except so, he never said that. Oh, but, he didn't? Um, no, there's no, you cannot find uh, um, anywhere where he actually said he would smash the CIA into a thousand pieces. See, that's the thing. There's so many different claims, right? It, it's hard to actually find out Kennedy, which ones are true. Without... Yeah, the reality was that Kennedy was a cold warrior. Right, and and he was greatly increasing the military budget. He was, uh, in fact, this whole speech that he was going to give in Dallas that day was a a list of all the military projects he was approving. He was proud of it. Yeah, yeah. Being an ex Navy guy, you know, I think that uh, he wanted he he was he you know everybody always sees that video of him talking about how there's a big giant military industrial complex and well, was you know him. you know we don't want that and that's why they assassinated him or whatever. But you know he he was pretty pro military. I mean he was. A veteran so it's it's kind of odd to play that card when i feel like he would be pro-military and pro mill industrial contract uh, military it's so hard to say that military industrial complex yeah it's the only thing i can say <laughs> he was very pro-military he was really into fighting communism rightly so i'm i'm very glad he was um he was really into it. He wanted to get rid and even even towards the end when there was this talk of rapprochement with castro Kennedy would only do any sort of rap crush on with Castro if Castro became more like Tito, independent of the Soviet Union, et cetera, et cetera. And Castro would never do that. Right. No. He got so much for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, he got a lot from us too, but <laughs> you know, he he put he put and, Cuba on the map, right? And this is the problem with the conspiracy people: is they say the same thing about Robert Kennedy. Well, Robert Kennedy was going to. Uh, uh, cure poverty, cure race relations, yeah. uh, end the all Vietnam wars, War. yeah. blah, blah, blah. He was the messiah coming to rule, but so, they, so he had to be killed. Right. 
But why not? Uh, why not Johnson though? Johnson was much more liberal, I think, than uh, Kennedy was. Uh, well, yeah, Ken- Johnson was incredible in the in the sense that he actually uh, did more for civil rights than Kennedy did. Oh yeah, civil rights, yeah, uh, all that stuff. And being from war Texas, on war on poverty, exactly. Yep. Yeah, and he had the support from Texas. Yeah, was, that was really conservative at the time. Um, being from here, uh, you mentioned your Facebook group. Um, and I want to hear, before we started, you started to tell a story, but we were going to save it for the podcast. I'm interested in your story about how you guys were, last time you were here in Dealey Plaza, and uh, you pulled out your uh, Manlicker yeah. Carcano rifle. Well, there's a Facebook group that I'm involved in, and we had a meetup in, in Dallas back in March before the coronavirus. And one of the members of the group uh, had bought a Manlicker Carcano rifle several months earlier, and we brought it to... Uh, to Daily Plaza, and um, we were taking pictures with it, and uh, we left. And then somebody called the police, and I think they cordoned off the area. I think it was the SWAT team looking for us <laughs> after you left, right? <laughs> we, 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 we were long gone. Oh man, I was probably there right around that time because I think after because we did the interview with. Uh, McAdams in like mid February, right? And then after that, I was real deep in my whole JFK kick. I was reading all the stuff that he told me about, and uh, I think I went down to Dealey Plaza several times, but I didn't see that unfortunately. So you guys had a rifle, or were you standing in front of the the book depository or back behind uh, the picket fence? The grassy or... knoll. The grassy knoll. Oh right? yeah, you're freaking people out now. Yeah, right in the grassy knoll, or of course where the second where the second shooter was. Right, the second or the third. Or the fourth. Well, the maybe the fourth. No. <laughs> um, I always think it's funny that every time I go there, my dog always likes to go number two right on the grassy you knoll. <laughs> There's something about it. He just loves it. He'll always go right there, and that's where he goes every single time. Can Lots you get over steps. to the train yard and look over the fence? Yep. Oh, can you? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very small area. I mean, it's well, so you know, small. you live here. You've been there. Yeah. But uh, I think a lot of people have this opinion that it's a much larger area, but you get there. Everything is just right there. Yeah, the first time we went to Daily Plaza, I got out of the Uber car and I looked around and I thought, is this Legoland? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so small. So yeah. small. It really is, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. yeah, everything is right. And that's, and that's again, the other thing. I know I mentioned before, I don't think I did it on the air, but uh, the thing that never made sense about conspiracy theorists, like if, if there was a shooter behind that picket fence, I mean, there was a bunch of people on the grassy knoll, right? There were people standing all over. I mean, Zapru- uh, Abraham Zapruder, for example. Um, well, I mean, this yeah. this would have been shot just a couple feet away from his head. And, and by the way, two things on that: if you do an analysis of of the ear witnesses to the assassination, only three people uh, ever thought that shots came from two different directions. Everybody else thought the shots came from one direction, either from the front or the back. Um, both Berenick and Newman, which is a firm in Boston, they did a study of the ear witnesses. And they said, had there been a shot from behind the picket fence, people would have known it. They would have heard it very clearly. Oh, yeah. And the, the echo is odd there, because if you look at the that wall memorial they had that's right there against that fence, it's actually curved in towards the plaza. Yeah, the whole so, thing is like almost like a, uh, like a big stadium. Yeah, so when way. he shoots, the sound is going to hit that spot and bounce backwards. So, it, it, I mean, you could stand there and honestly think that somebody's shooting from behind you just because of the way that, that mem- it's not a memorial, but it's just like a wall they have there, that white wall in the back. It's just curved the to make it make this, it? yeah, to make, the, to make the sound actually bounce towards the people that are standing there on the, on the grassy knoll. And who was the guy, uh, maybe Fred, you'll know this, uh, the guy in the control booth of the train? Oh, Bowers. Lee Bowers. Bowers Lee Bowers, yep. Yeah. He actually testified that that summer, just a few months before the assassination, they were doing construction work on the uh, Texas School Book Depository, right? And he said a lot of the times, like the jackhammers and stuff, it sounded like it was coming from over near like the grass and all in the overpass. Yeah, there were a number of witnesses who testified to the echo and the fact that they really weren't sure where the shots came from. Zapruder said there was an echo. Um, so, yeah, people, people knew that there was a strange place for sound. Yeah, and it was it, that spot's right behind Zapruder. So if he, if anybody was going to hear much, it, it'd yeah. be him. Yeah, a little bit to the side, but but yeah. It, and then the other thing I like too is uh, I heard this. I think uh, McAdams told us this story that when they were making the movie JFK, 
they made a, a big fuss about this smoke, this puff of smoke, right? right. That supposedly yeah. people saw coming from behind or near the picket fence. And then they thought that was proof that uh, somebody shot a gun. Um, I guess when they were making that movie, they couldn't find a gun that produced a big cloud of smoke. So they had to go get uh, smoke machines to actually right. make smoke. Because no guns make a big, it's a, you know, these are not like the 17th century muskets. muskets. Yeah, we don't use smokeless, or we don't use smoke gunpowder. It's all smokeless, yeah. smokeless, right? It wouldn't create a big right. smoke. Yeah, um, he, got, he got a smoke machine to make the smoke. Yeah. <laughs> and there's other theories about that too, right? There were people behind the picket fence at the time. I think Lee Bowers testified to that. And they were smoking well, cigarettes. He saw, it could have been he, cigarette he saw smoke. two cars there. He saw two people behind the picket fence, but they weren't with each other. They were no. separate. They, and, and and they saw something else, but he wasn't really sure what he saw. And and so his testimony really went nowhere. So what do you think of the Warren report in whole? Because you know, there's a lot of critic, uh, yeah, a lot of criticism of it. Personally, I think they did a pretty good job. I, obviously, there were mistakes, but I mean, it was pretty thorough for not knowing what the criticisms were going to be later on. Like the different random facts are going to pull out from out of nowhere, right? And then yeah, like, I think, I think you didn't was, uh, investigate this part. I think it was an honest investigation done by honest people. Um, their big mistake was not having a team of forensic pathology look at the autopsy, x-rays, and photographs. Yeah, they hit that on they hit on that a lot. No autopsy done. You hear you saw that. I bet I heard that ten times in that JFK movie. There was no autopsy done. You know, they use that as an excuse out of a lot of things. Or or they changed, yeah. Right. Yeah. Had the Warren report issued a, a, a very, very definitive report on the wounds of Kennedy and Connolly by forensic pathologists, that would have eliminated a lot of the doubt. Uh, about the, the whole nature of the shooting, and that may have forestalled a lot of the criticism. Do right. you? Do you? They also ended too too early. They they really should have extended. They wanted a report before the election. I think they uh, should have had a mechanism to continue the investigation after the election, and and wind up any loose uh, loose threads. Do you think there's any other possibility or a possible explanation for a single shooter, other than the whole magic bullet theory? Because I, I know in the Warren report, they actually kind of say that um, this is the theory we're putting forward of what happened. Three shots, one missed, one hit Kennedy. Uh, and the very upper back came out through his throat, you know, then hit Conley. Uh, and the third one hit Kennedy in the head. Uh, but they said that it doesn't rely upon just that happening. There could have been something else. Do you think there is any other possible explanation for a different series yeah. of events that happened with a single shooter? I don't think so because the uh, they're, they're, they're Kennedy and Connolly were in alignment, and you, if, look, if you look at the work of Dale Myers, who did a great 3D oh, animation, 3D. yeah, that was um, good. it just shows they were in complete alignment to the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Hmm. So there's there's really no other one. Um, I don't think cause, so because that's the big uh, argument, right? The whole pristine bullet, and again, they brought that up in the JFK movie. Yeah, except the bullet wasn't that pristine. It was flattened on one side, and that was because the bullet uh, tumbled after it exited Kennedy's throat, and it started tumbling, and and went through Connolly sideways, and then actually reversed. It went backwards through his wrist, so it it was flattened in the process. Right, and it was a it was a full metal jacket too. It wasn't a exactly, soft point full or metal anything jacket, else. Jacket of bullets. Because I think uh, I don't know if you ever watched the Joe Rogan podcast. But he used to talk about the JFK assassination a few times, and he said, "Oh, I've I've shot a lot of a lot of guns, and I've never seen a bullet come out looking that pristine, like that perfect." Um, he's like, "I go hunting all the time. I shoot a lot of stuff. I never see a bullet like that." But when you go hunting, normally you use a soft point, right? Soft point bullets still that are exposed on the top. Those are made that way to to compress, to flatten when it hits something, when it, you hit a deer. With the full metal yeah, jacket that Oswald used and they use in the military is designed to, you know, pe uh, penetrate. And, yeah, you know. that's exactly right. I mean, that was one of the problems when you had Cyril Wecht and other forensic pathologists criticizing the autopsy and the single bullet theory. The fact is that they they perform civilian autopsies. They don't really do military autopsies. And so they rarely, they rarely see fully jacketed uh, weapons, uh, uh, firearms being used. Yeah, and also, I mean, the bullet kind of got through without hitting anything in, anything vital or real dense in Kennedy, right? It just pretty much went through tissue. Yeah, it went through, through tissue. Missed, missed exactly, the spline. Yes. Spline. The spline. <laughs> um, and then went through the air, and that's when it probably started to lose... Uh, velocity. 
lose velocity, then also kind of lose its axis, you know, uh, stabilization, started to yaw, and then went into Conley at a slight angle, right? And then it hit a rib, but it probably hit the rib sideways. And it yeah, just kind of glanced off of it too, right? And then, and then went through the wrist. Right. And then that's the other thing a lot of people bring up. So the Warren Commission... They fired a bunch of test rounds, right? I'm sure you've seen that picture yeah. of the yeah. five different rounds, and nothing looks anything as good as the pristine bullet. Yeah, except that's a that's a, a test round fired directly into a into a wrist bone, as opposed to one that slowed down by going through soft tissue and then Connolly's chest. Right. right. Uh, I don't know if you saw the Discovery uh, Discovery TV show. They did a recreation of the single bullet theory. I don't think and, so. Oh, it's an amazing recreation. They had. Uh, they had gelatin for the neck, Kennedy's neck, and they 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 did a, they had a, a mock up of the chest, and they fired a mounted Carcano bullet through it, and it came out unscathed, hmm. but flattened. Hmm. Flattened on its, uh, not vertically, I guess. No, it was flattened just like the just like the uh, squeeze uh, commission for the three ninety nine. Huh. It tumbled. It did exactly as as predicted. And then the other bullets, too. I mean, this is one point I see a lot of conspiracy theorists bring up. So that was one of them, right? They fired it directly into a wrist. The other one they fired directly into, I think it was a goat, like right into a rib. And that smashed yep. directly into the rib. That's different yep. than what happened with Conley. And again, also, uh, 399, uh, the bullet that Oswald fired, was slowing down a lot because it had passed through Kennedy. You know, it was starting to tumble. That was losing more velocity because of that. And then also, Conley was, the, you know, the slimmest guy in the world. So there was a little more tissue to kind of slow down in there. Yeah. Um, but the other one though, they showed that they fired into cotton and just caught it. And that one seemed to have more damage than uh, 399. Well, that came out pretty pristine, but I, I think that it, uh, again, um, you just have to go to that discovery uh, recreation. I mean, I don't, I don't think the single bullet theory is, is um, that unlikely. And I think it's the best theory we have that explains the evidence. I'd like to, nobody's come up with a better theory. Right. Right. Yeah. The other theories they have, you know, you think, Oh, if you can't perfectly explain this, that means there must've been a conspiracy, but all the actual theories that conspiracy theories have put forth have a lot more problems. Right. Like I did hear somebody say about the one that was shot into cotton. I think I was reading a testimony from some ballistics expert during the uh, house Select committee on assassins. I'm sure you probably read that one too. I think he mentioned that cotton is actually more dense than human tissue. Like you think about it because it's spread out, but right, yeah. in general, the individual threads and that's it has to go point. through enough of them to finally slow down. Right. That, yeah, that that's, a, that's a really good point. Yeah. Any other questions before we want to start talking about this book? Um, no, just you guys were talking about hypnosis. I was wondering. Oh yeah, we can get into that a little bit <laughs> if you have time. Yeah, yeah, I want to. I want to. So. Yeah, I want to know a little bit. So I'm not. A, you know, I guess hypnosis is also kind of this kind of weird conspiracy thing too, because a lot of people think that it's all just made up bullshit. Yeah. And some people can get into it, some not. It just seems kind of. I think it's kind of in, in between. There's some reality. There's, but there's a lot of <clears throat> people are crazy, right? They're gonna buy into stupid shit. It is what it is. But <laughs> you know, like maybe you could talk a little bit more about the hypnosis and like how it affected the story. Yeah, the, the story because that's that's so. pretty. Because you, I mean, I, you, I remember growing up in the '90s, and you're watching uh, Jerry Springer and all these, all these stupid <laughs> talk shows, and these guys are running around like the chickens. The test and everything. Yeah, they look, stuff, they yeah. look stupid running around like they're all hypnosis. But you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, maybe, maybe even some of the science behind it. Anybody ever look into any of that shit? Or oh, and and real quick too. So just to make it clear yeah. for people who might not be following along or as big of nerds on all this stuff as I am and uh, Fred is, I'm sorry to say that, but I know I'm obsessed with it. I can't, I know I'm a nerd. Um, Perry Russo was a star witness, right? He was pretty much it. He was the whole thing that Garrison had to try to convict Clay Shaw. That was it. Nothing else. Garrison had maybe what, 20 other witnesses, but none of them actually testified. Yeah. They mostly were the, the Shaw and Ferry knew each other. Exactly. but and 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 Clay Shaw was arrested really solely on on uh, on the the testimony of Perry Russo. Right, Nothing right else. after Russo gave his testimony, it was a couple weeks later, right, that they went and arrested um, Shaw. Yeah, it was right. Yeah, it was right after, and uh, they had Perry Russo identify him, and then they arrested him. Okay, so Perry Russo at the time, this was again, this was what four or five 
years after the assassination. Uh, he had moved up to Baton Rouge, right? And Yeah, he was working for an insurance company in Baton Rouge, and David Ferry died, and he knew David Ferry, and so he contacted the newspaper in Baton Rouge saying, hey, I knew David Ferry, and uh, yeah, you know, occasionally he would talk about uh, that we will stuff. get Kennedy. And the newspaper people came to him and interviewed him, and he was on TV, and you can read the transcripts of his interview. He said nothing about Clay Shaw, nothing about a party. Nothing uh, about any planned assassination and yeah. conspiracy. And then he claimed that. that he wrote a letter to Jim Garrison, although that letter is That's cannot be found. Right. And Garrison sent Andrew Chambra, his uh, assistant district attorney, to Baton Rouge to interview uh, Perry Russo. And Perry Russo said nothing about a party. He said that he had met Clay Shaw twice in his life. Once when Kennedy spoke in Nashville in 1962, and once at a service station uh, where he took his car, and that was it. And um, Schomburg went back to New Orleans, wrote up his memo. They brought Perry Russo to New Orleans, and they put him, uh, they injected him with sodium pentothal. A true serum. serum. Yeah. And but that's where they started to implant the memory of this party. I think that's important to explain, too, because truth serum, that's not what it is, right? No, it um, basically relaxes you, and you could, you know, it, it really, um, it's an opportunity to uh, implant some memories and stories and allows you to fantasize. It's it's not a truth serum. and uh, No. And then they hypnotized them three times after that. <laughs> and uh, they really brainwashed them. And, in fact... Perry Russo admitted in 1971 when he was Mr. speaking Diamond, to right? Clay Shaw's attorneys that um, the signals were huge as to what they wanted him to say. Yeah, they kept saying that was Clay Shaw, right? You saw Clay well, Shaw, they there, kept right? Been saying we have to we have to connect Clay Shaw and David Ferry together. We have to connect them, and and uh, so he knew what his role was, and uh, and he he went along with this and came up with this story. Yeah, I kind of feel bad for him because he was trapped. Read the transcript of the hypnosis sessions. Uh, he was led. The first person to talk about assassinating anybody was the uh, the guy who put him under hypnosis. Mm. Uh, that's not right. Yeah, because the whole theory kind of behind uh, sodium pentothal and then also hypnosis is that it's supposed to lower your inhibitions, right? So right, you don't yeah. feel a reason to lie. You don't feel the need to lie to try to preserve something. Uh, you know, the reason most people lie. Uh, but the problem is that it'll lower your inhibition so much that you don't even feel the need to tell the truth. Right. Yeah, you, <laughs> you know, fantasize. you're open to fantasizing yeah. and, and anything. Yeah, exactly. So you can actually kind of have things implanted, false memories. And if, if people keep repeating the same thing over and over, you know, you were I'll, there. I'll tell, I'll tell you a funny there. story. I have the document in my book. Garrison sent a letter to Dean Andrews, you know, because he wanted Dean Andrews to remember if uh, who Clay Bertrand was. And he said, come to our office. We can offer some refreshing techniques oh. like sodium pentothal and hypnosis. Wow. And that's in my book. And and Garrison and all uh, and his investigators, everyone, they knew this stuff would not be admissible, right? Yeah. And they, well, they knew that that um, it, it, it's sort of, well, the, the a lie detector test would not be admissible. Right. Lie detector, right. but the story that, that Russo would, would say is admissible because it's his, now is it's his memory. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird one. It, the whole it, thing it's is so really wild. a crazy story. Yeah. And, and not only that, but you can imagine Perry Russo was probably terrified. Like he saw what happened with Dean Andrews, right? Like Dean Andrews was going to be a witness, and he was in the preliminary hearings. Um, well, he also Dean Perry Russo asked uh, Chambra, uh, "You guys have other evidence besides me, don't you? I mean, I'm yeah. not you're not hanging the whole case on me, are you?" And uh, they said, "Oh yeah, sure, we have lots of other evidence," but they had nothing. And then even during the trial too, I thought it was kind of funny how under cross examination, Perry Russo kept saying. Oh yeah, I was a hundred percent. I'm a hundred percent sure that Shaw, was, you know, Clay Shaw is uh, Clem Bertram, um, but I wanted to be a thousand percent sure. <laughs> and they kept questioning him, like, "What do you mean? If you're a hundred percent sure, that means you're sure. Like, why do you have to be a thousand? He's like, "Well, you know what I mean. So you probably weren't a hundred percent sure originally, then." <laughs> yeah, and, and initially he said that uh, so two of his other friends were at the 
party, and of course they denied it, and this story was just patently ridiculous. Yeah, and and no one else could testify to it too, right? I think he mentioned what Chandra Muffet. Uh, that was Sandra Moffat, who was his girlfriend. She she said she had never met Ferry until uh, 1965. Yeah, and the whole thing. So so he was under sodium pentothal. He, he took a few lie detector tests too, right? And then the hypnosis. Yeah, and 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 uh, he told uh, Shaw's lawyers when you know the when he was injected with sodium pentothal, he became quite violent. They had to help. They had to hold him down on the table. He was kicking and screaming, and uh, it was a horrible scene after he was injected. Wow. Huh. And yeah, again, I think that would be terrifying. Like, like I, I was saying, like with uh, Dean Andrews, you know, he was started to testify, and then he find, he, he had to come clean, and he's like, okay, I made up the name. I probably, I probably made up the name. Um, yeah. Well, I was under a lot of drugs. And then uh, Garrison charged him with perjury, and he went away to prison for... Like a few years, I think. I forget the exact. Oh, uh, he didn't time. go. No, he didn't go away. He was charged with perjury. But um, back in in nineteen, um, when Clay Shaw was fighting Garrison, there was a three day hearing in January nineteen seventy one, and Perry Russo was put on the stand, and he took the Fifth Amendment. He That's wouldn't right, testify yeah. about what happened. He took the fifth. And this was during and, the perjury trial of Clay Shaw, or, or no, no, it was, wasn't. It was, was it was during this, the when Shaw was, was trying to file a restraining order. Yeah, this was a three-day uh, 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 hearing uh, t- to determine if the trial would go forward. Okay, because and right, I mean, this was and right after, right after that, uh, his testimony, where, right after that, that same night, he went to visit Shaw's attorneys. Right, and he, he admitted and he, that, and he admitted he basically said, "Look, I was brainwashed. They told me what to say." Um, and he said, "In fact, uh, they took the script from the sodium pentothal." Uh, session and they use that as to, to and hypnosis to sort of uh, guide me in my testimony. Hmm. That was the script. Yeah. But he knew if he said that in that three day hearing, Garrison would charge him with perjury. Hmm. So he had to plead the fifth then at that point. So he had to plead the fifth. It was the only way out. Yeah. And then whatever happened to uh, Perry Russo afterward then? Because I, I heard some people said that he later on admitted that it was, uh, you know, it didn't actually happen. Other people said, no, he never admitted that. I think he actually made a cameo appearance in JFK, right? He made a cameo appearance in JFK. He became a taxi driver in New Orleans. He drove a cab. He never really formally admitted that it was all, all a, a hoax, but he did make some pretty damning statements privately to Shaw's attorneys. And I have the transcript of those sessions, but he never said anything publicly about um, a Clay Shaw not being Clay Bertrand. Hmm. And then uh, Garrison, after this was all over, he continued on. He won re-election again, right? Continued to be district attorney. He won, um, more, won more election. He won re-election. And then ultimately he after judged. that, he was defeated by Harry Connick Sr. He was what? He was defeated by Harry Connick, Harry oh, okay. Connick Sr. Did he become a judge? Yeah, he ran for one judgeship, lost that, then he became an appeals court judge. Um, and that's where he worked his final years as a, as a judge. And then a lot of people kind of, you know, they kind of dismiss the case. They're like, okay, you know, that was wrong. Doesn't mean there wasn't a conspiracy necessarily, but Garrison's investigation was wrong. And uh, I, I think a lot of, you know, more credible conspiracy believers kind of, you know, they don't believe his case anymore. Um, but then he was kind of rehabilitated by Oliver Stone, right, in the movie. Yeah, it's a very sad fact that Oliver Stone made Clay Shaw a villain a second time. And he chose to make Arison the hero. It's, it's a horrible miscarriage again. I mean, Tommy Lee Jones played Clay Shaw as quite an evil villain. Yeah, it seemed that way. Yeah. And, and it made uh, him look very villainy in the movie. Oh, yeah. And yeah, and Garrison was this great guy, you know, yeah. just trying to do the honorable thing. Um, not drugging or hypnotizing yeah, anyone. Yeah, they don't talk a whole about a whole lot about that. No, no, that was left out. Uh, one random question I had here written down, I forgot to ask earlier. Why was Jack Martin never called to testify during the trial? Just he was just too unreliable. Yeah, he was a nut. I mean, I mean, my God, he'd be the last person you want to testify. That would be an easy. He was a former felon. Yeah, did, did he uh, kill somebody? 
in Texas? Uh, well, he was wanted for uh, he, he might he, he was wanted for murder, but he also uh, was an abortionist, and and um, so he had a horrible past, and and everybody knew in New Orleans that he was completely unreliable. So uh, no, there's no way Garrison would put him on the stand. Yeah. And and it was too obvious. They couldn't try to sneak a Charles Spiel uh, a, a, a past uh, the defense attorneys, unlike uh, Jack Martin, who's probably too obviously a, a kind of a kook, right? Yeah. Um, anything else we didn't cover about Garrison? Do you think we covered it pretty well? Well, I hope people read my book because I have a lot of primary documents in my book um, from his case. And so you don't have to believe me. You could read the documents yourself. Oh. <laughs> Maybe we just pulled your web page up. <laughs> I get an ad for it. There you go. And the book is called On the Trail of Delusion. And uh, I mean, this is based kind of on Garrison's book, right? The title a little bit. So That's Garrison right. wrote a book called On the Trail of the Assassins. Right. And and the subtitle is uh, the great Jim Garrison, the Great Accuser. And that comes from Harry Connick Sr. In one of the campaigns against Garrison, he called Garrison the Great Accuser. Hmm. And he did. He just, he just, we would charge people all the time, right? Like he charged he, a whole bunch of judges, like we said, his, his predecessor. He would go down to, uh, you know, Bourbon Street and just lock up a bunch of the uh, bars and stuff and arrest people for indecent, ex- for all that stuff, right? And then the charges would never go anywhere. Yeah, well, he did that. And also, of course, he accused everybody and anybody of, of being involved in the assassination. I mean, it was just like every day, <laughs> a, different, a different theory and a different person or agency. I mean, it was nonstop. Shouldn't laugh about it. But uh, looking back on it, it's, it's kind of funny. But I mean, living there at the time, that must have been terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the book is out now, right? The book is out in electronic and print format. Awesome. Buy it right here. No available for now. Oh, now available. I can't read. Oh, and the other thing you were talking about is your website, uh, conspiracyfreak.com. You're talking about how you're about to get one of the videos of the hypnosis. Oh, yeah. I'm going to post on 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 the trail on the trail of delusion. I'm going to post uh, not a video but an audio of the second hypnosis se- session. Oh, okay, an audio. That'll yeah. be real cool. Yeah, that'll be fun to listen to. Because I've always yeah. been interested in trying to find any audio recording. You know, there's just a few news segments where you actually see Clay Shaw talking. Because you read about all this in the paper. Um, you read about all of it on the internet. And, uh, you know, it's just so blah, right? You don't actually get to see the people behind it, see the pictures of the people, and hear their voice. Uh, you know, Clay Shaw had a very deep voice, very commanding. You know, he was very well-spoken. He didn't say many words, but when he did... Uh, you know, he really delivered a punch, it seemed like. And he had a good yeah. sense of humor, too. Yeah, so it's going to be a little bit of a news story. I don't, I don't think anybody has heard this uh, this tape before. That'll be cool. Right. Yeah. yeah, I don't think I could find anything of Russo talking, so I think that'll be interesting. But yeah, I mean, I don't, have any, I don't know if you got anything else. I think we're pretty much wrapped up here. Um, anything else you want to talk about before we close up? No, if you have any follow-up questions, just get back to me. I'd be happy to come on again. And uh, if anybody, any listeners have questions, always happy to answer them. Yeah, make sure you follow Fred on Twitter at Fred Litwin. Yeah, you got a good ta- you got a good handle. You got your, just your name. That's the most, yeah. best yeah. way to get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we already have some people uh, leaving some comments on here. The round that hit JFK was not the same caliber as the rifle that was found in upstairs sniper's nest. Um, you know, I, I think the important thing to remember, you know, if you do believe there is a conspiracy, is to to look up the other side's explanation. Um, it's just like if you're in politics. If you're a Democrat and you say, hey, look how evil the Republicans are, you need to actually go to the Republicans and see what their response is to it. Same thing if you're a Republican, you know, and vice versa, all that. You have to go to the other side and actually see what they're saying. Uh, not just what your own side is saying, the other side is saying. It's like in a court case, right? You got to hear from the defendant. And you got to hear from the prosecutor. You hear from both sides. You don't just say, okay, the prosecutor, let's see what you have to say. We're not even going to let the defendant speak. Um, yeah, and people should not just read conspiracy books and take them as true. Um, there's a lot of, of false information in conspiracy books. It's, and it's so hard to sort it out. I mean, you heard me. I, I mentioned a couple of them, and I didn't even know that. Like about the CIA being smashed into a million pieces. I was not even aware that that wasn't even said. There's so many things that just have kind of been driven in and snuck in there that are it's just hard to fight against the tide. 
Um, so I think that's the important thing to remember. Always, you know, go to the source and look up and see what the other side is saying. Look up and see what your side is saying and see which one makes more sense. And that's really the only advice uh, that I have on it, at least. Yep. Good advice. But all right. Thanks for joining us. I think that wraps it up for this week. Yeah. Don't Thank hang up great. yet. Don't hang up yet. Fred. We're